Uh, our first up for today, um, where we have Russell Handorf, who's going to be speaking about practical SIGINT. So if you put your hands together for Russell. <laughs> I wish those in TV land could see what I see right now. I'm greatly humbled. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, it's it's ShmooCon. It's fantastic. It's last day. There's some sporting event maybe going on that's going to make the drive home a whole lot easier for a handful of us. But nonetheless, um, I, my name is Russ, for those who haven't met me. Um, I uh, work for a wonderful company called White Ops. I'm a retired uh, federal employee. I'm actually a uh, recovering fedaholic. Uh, a little bit more about myself is that I absolutely love haikus. So if you uh, happen to throw one at me, you're going to get more than a hug. And um, yeah, I have a wonderful family at home uh, who greatly support me in the various projects that linger around the house longer than they probably have. Like for instance, the dining room table should not apparently be a uh, laboratory. Um, but um, I just wanna say like, think uh, the, the stuff that I'm about to say is not endorsed by anyone or anything. It's all based upon uh, things that I've done myself no prior life experience uh, other than personal experience are in this. Uh, and in the sense of being a recovering fedaholic, uh, if you Google me, you'll know where I came from. I am not going to say that organization's name because if you say it three times, it's going to be exactly uh, like an attorney's going to show up, like a ghost uh, from a similar movie genre that if you said that ghost's name three times, um, you would have a bad time later. So <laughs> nevertheless. The style of the presentation that I'm going to give to you is going to be about like a maybe a 10,000 foot view. There's more information on my website about the detail nitty gritty of being able to do what you're going to uh, hopefully be able to do in the future for this. But I'm going to give you some cliff notes and then show you some demos about how you can draw the rest of the damn owl. <coughs> so specifically, I'm going to cover the binomial nomenclature of what the Soho SIGINT mean. Uh, some use cases that I've had personally out of it and some anecdotal stories from other individuals who ran some really crappy code that I wrote a long time ago. Uh, then kind of where the project has migrated to uh, and some other really great experiences with working with um, Magic Mike, who's wonderfully sitting right up here uh, and integrating some of these things into Kismet how you can integrate your stuff into Kismet as well rather quickly and easily. I built some custom hardware in great haste. If anyone wants uh, circuit boards, you can either go to the Wireless Village to pick up some there, or I've got a few hand, uh, handful of ones left. And we'll see if uh, the blood sacrifice to the demo gods uh, was well received or not. So binomial nomenclature uh, is generally the process that uh, or, uh, biologists follow in order to name a new thing. So the binomial nomenclature, what we're going to look at is like Soho SIGINT. So small home, small office, right? It's going to be small, lightweight sort of stuff. SIGINT, signals intelligence. Ideally, <coughs> what I was looking at was building a platform a long time ago that would allow me to identify who was coming onto my property at my house very quickly, very inexpensively using commodity hardware that anyone could purchase off of Amazon. And then compare that information to fingerprint it from the information from the SIGID wiki, uh, which is a fantastic uh, resource for anyone who uh, is doing software defined radio and wants to get into it. There's some, they have a great index of like, hey, we've identified this signal, here's the uh, waterfall plot for it, uh, wave file audio sample for you to be able to hear it. And uh, it's, it's great cliff, Cliff's Notes things. And they cover everything from typical like POXAG stuff to <coughs> number stations to uh, car key fobs, all that sort of fun stuff. <coughs> so specifically my version of Soho SIGINT started off uh, with a uh, personal dilemma. Um, my family had moved uh, further into the suburbs and we had no street lights and the house was far back on the property line and uh, I, I felt I needed a little bit more physical security uh, for myself at the time. So the first thing that I did was put beam brake sensors in the driveway so I could tell that something came in and I wanted to add some more fidelity, fidelity to it. So I developed some geophones which are 
you could buy the uh, Geophone itself on uh, uh, eBay, but it's just another Arduino doing simple FFT and just ground spike that. Um, it worked poorly, but well enough-ish, uh, ripped those out. But I was then able to ascertain whether or not it was a vehicle or a person or a thing that was coming in. That left and uh, was augmented by what I was describing as Soho SIGINT, which was essentially taking Raspberry Pi, throw some radio uh, sniffing gear on it, and uh, uh, because everyone has electronic devices on them in various forms and fashions, uh, from their cell phones to the TPMS transmitters and the wheels of their car to the Bluetooth and the system of the vehicle, all that sort of stuff. And I wanted to be able to not just know so much as what was coming onto my property, but who. And that was important for me because I needed to know whether or not I needed to put pants on before I opened the door. So if it was my in-laws, they got pants. If it was proselytizers, no pants. So the other aspect of the build process was that my wife required it to not be creepy, because uh, she knows that I can go creepy really quick. So there was a data retention policy of like, uh, if your device has not been seen after a certain period of time, expunge it. So I started this in 2016. Uh, early February, and it started off with any other project, writes in C code as a PCAP handler and just shoved it into a database, uh, embedded it on some hardware, so I ran it on um, Hack5, gave me some uh, pineapples, and I wrote it to run on some Hack5s, because that was uh, straightforward. Capture your data, turn it into JSON, poop it into a database, Bob's your uncle. Uh, and it was running for about a year and a half, shared it with a handful of folks, uh, and I got some really neat stories out of it. But with any sort of thing, if you're going to start collecting radio signals, you need to slap up antennas wherever you can. And my favorite one was the one on the right, which I call the festive coaxial collinear antenna uh, for ADSB. And uh, it's now in the attic, but for the longest time it was not. It was downstairs in the family room. And my wife is a very patient lady. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and she said, Russ, what's that thing doing in the window? And I said, it's, it's my coaxial collinear antenna that I'm making to test for airplanes. She goes, get it out. I go, but it's festive. Um, <laughs> that, so it went into the attic shortly thereafter. So you collect your baseline, and I was able to start determining what neighbors were having new children because they had baby monitors turning on. Uh, so that was useful. Uh, there were a couple of new... Um, <laughs> Elmo dolls showed up shortly thereafter because uh, they have Bluetooth. Anyways, <clears throat> because of my previous employer, every five years they kind of do a background check on you again just to make sure you're on the up and up, I guess. And uh, that was when my neighbors found out who I worked for, uh, despite having a vehicle with light bars and tinted windows and all that sort of stuff. They pegged me as an architect, which was kind of accurate. Um, so my neighbors came up and talked to me, and they, they asked, hey, so we have this weird problem. What's going on? Well, money's being stolen out of my car. OK. Yeah, like I can leave, like uh, it could be five cents in the change uh, or like a $20 bill in my wallet, but my wallet's still there, my phone's still there, my laptop's still there. I was like, oh, are you sure it's not your kid that's like stealing? No, it's not my kid. Do you want me to like scare, scary talk your kid? Like, no, 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 it's fine. It's not my kid. It's like, you lock your car? He's like, no, no, I'm not going to lock my car. I was like, that. Okay, I'm not going to get into a religious discussion about that. So uh, we came up with a um, operation where uh, it was, uh, I do a lot of hunting, and people are animals, <laughs> I think. Uh, but <clears throat> animals. Uh, so what I had him do was move his car further to the left in the driveway so it had a bit more of a protected visible barrier as an individual would walk up the driveway at night. They'd take cover on that side of the vehicle so they couldn't be seen from the bedroom windows. And I had some overgrowth on my side of the driveway so they couldn't see the windows of my house, but I put a camera on a fence post on my side of the property line with consent from him uh, to look into the direction of, uh, uh, Oh, wait, I'm one slide ahead. Uh, but to uh, look on that driveway, and uh, I, I'm one slide ahead, so that's the next slide, but I'll, I'll come up to that in a moment. But also, real quick, ADHD was the um, 
uh, when I was running the project, Halloween was the best night ever for collection uh, for any kind of SIGINT process because they're coming to you with all their electronic devices and your phone is broadcasting your wireless SSID and I got to attribute whose dog was pooping in my yard. <clears throat> so anyways, this was the, uh, yeah, the information about um, the neighbor who was having this problem. So we came up with Operation Catch the Fucker. Um, I told you this was a PG-13 talk. I get to use that word once. I get to use another word once, and I could probably also show you bare buttocks for seven seconds. <laughs> Mike Osman was kind and gracious, uh, but declined. Um, but anyways, yeah, my neighbor, like, he, he realized something was wrong when he withdrew $200, spent 20, and the remaining 180 was just stolen out of his wallet. So this was like weird. So we came up with Operation Catch the, F and I can't say it again, uh, PG-13. And so he showed up the first night, which was amazing. So in the first day he comes up, uh, the rest of the video, I'm, this is the first frame out of the video, but he comes all the way up and he's got a flashlight in his hand and he's kind of like strobing this like weird red eye that's looking at him and he gets close up enough that you see him mouth, oh, er, and then duck waddles away. So we called the police, they got the video, uh, the detective recognized him because he was a frequent customer and I told the uh, detective, hey, uh, this is kind of who I am and what I do for my day job is not related to this, but I know, you know, legal process and things like that. For what it's worth, uh, when, you, when you decide to talk to him, if you could get the MAC address off of his phone, uh, maybe, maybe I, I captured some other correlating data and all that. So I, I know this sounds weird, but uh, totally, it's legal, it's fine, it's only beacons and probes and the hand, yeah, okay, so. So the uh, detective gave me the, uh, the MAC address and on the right side is um, uh, the first night that he walked by uh, and it was approximately at 2.40 in the morning. So I captured him just about every single time coming around my house between like two to three in the morning and the following day, uh, someone in the neighborhood would report to the police a theft of the vehicle. So this was used as evidence against him in trial uh, that put him in jail for three or four months. Uh, so I was like, wow, this, this actually can augment your physical security for your house uh, beyond uh, determining whether or not you need to put pants on or not. And uh, there was another uh, story where I um, shared the code inside, uh, at the time it was the IRC channel for Kismet, and where it was, it was a fellow up in like uh, Sweden, I guess, uh, where he had a, um, his girlfriend was being stalked uh, by her ex-boyfriend, so they ran the same code on a Raspberry Pi and they couldn't prove it until the individual showed up and it, uh, uh, so because you can make highlight alerts in Kismet of the presence of a device, it, it alerted um, that uh, this was also later after we started doing some code integration, but it alerted when uh, he was there and that helped aid in the uh, prosecution of that individual. So this stuff has some actual utility from beyond home automation or anything else along those lines. It, it can help you. Um, have a little bit more peace of mind, but that's that's part of the problem with security stuff. Is like security cameras are great, but they're a forensics tool. They're not anything. They show you something that happened, uh, not what's happening, because no one's watching stuff when it's happening. So this shows you something where someone was there, uh, until you add in some alerting and stuff that can bring some attention to things that are happening now. So, anyways, so I'm going through this code development, and then one day, I got a message from Dragorn. I may have killed your project by accident. <laughs> and that was my response, but it was a good response. Uh, so I was like, oh shit. So uh, what ended up happening was uh, at the time, Kismet was predominantly in curses. And uh, Mike did a lot of work to bring in a web-based UI uh, to it, and that was fantastic. So shortly thereafter, um, I started shifting my focus of like away from my project because I'm a horrible web front end developer. I'm, I asked my wife like what clothes I need to wear and she says shut up. So I wear a black t-shirt and 5.11s. So um, unless we're going out to eat and then she pulls out my wardrobe for me which is great because uh, I can't choose my own clothes for anything. So Soho Sigint is dead, long live Kismet. 
Uh, a lot of the functionality that I was working on and some additional things are now living in Kismet. Dragorn is right up here on the front, ladies and gentlemen. This is him uh, after a wonderful snow day at his house. Please support him on his Patreon and GitHub. Um, because I, as a friend of his, I feel a little bit frustrated in the sense that everyone has heard of Kismet and everyone uses it, but no one's buying him beers and getting him drunk. That's great, but no. Uh, <laughs> or buying him his tooling or toys and gizmos. But here's a way to financially support some of the fun and development and all of that because he's been running this pro bono for everyone for two decades, almost at this point. Um, but yeah, please, uh, please support him any way possible. Uh, no tickles. So this is kind of like a rough timeline of events from between when I totally abandoned my project and started focusing on integrating some things into Kismet and working with Mike, who was an excellent teacher in bringing me up to speed about his code base and some of the frameworks behind it. So he started rewriting Kismet uh, from incurses. It still has an incurses option. Uh, not anymore? I, I thought it did. No? Okay. Thank God. Um, <laughs> All right, that is fantastic, more good news. So it's uh, got a fantastic web-based UI. So you can now uh, render, did, did you do the uh, component about web-based uh, to the cell phone? No, oh, no, it's Quintero. Oh, yeah, well, you're, you're the same, you're all foreigners. Uh, <laughs> no. Oh, well, that's right. Yes, yeah. So you're the you're the reason why my my system alerts one time whenever you show up. <laughs> um, so yeah, Kintero did uh, the front end for it, so it looks nice on your cell phone, which is fantastic. Uh, so it's a whole lot more cleaner. You don't have to run it on your phone, but the presentation of it for uh, for it is there. Then Mike uh, integrated RTL 433 uh, into Kismet, which was a really great first step learning curve for me because this was when Python started becoming uh, e more easily integrated as an initial collection function, and then you can shove it into Kismet with a very little bit of C++, and I'm gonna show you how. And then shortly thereafter, I picked up and adding in ADSB and AMR uh, into Kismet, so you can now track planes and your neighbor's parameters. Don't be too creepy with that. Uh, because of my inability to read uh, licensing schemas, uh, I'm paying attention to that. Mike refactored all of my code, so it's now GPL version two, uh, but completely refactored doing software-defined radio at the baseband level versus like another application front end and uh, shoving uh, code that way. And then, uh, yeah, don't use my project at all anymore. It's dead. I haven't touched it in a while. I'm now focusing entirely on shoving stuff into Kismet, not Mike. Um, <laughs> but the... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Too early for that, um, but now Kismet does all this stuff for me and it can do it for you too, and here's how. So the current state, it does a lot of the same stuff that everyone thinks it can do. It does all that stuff well, but did you know that you can track airplanes with Kismet? Did you know that you can read tire pressure sensors off of cars with Kismet? Did you know you can read uh, temperature sensors from your neighbor's houses or other weather stations and things like that in Kismet. Did you know you can be creepy, with, uh, not creepy, uh, but do some other stuff? Well, you can now, and some of the other things that I'm working on, uh, it's not so much, it's in continuous R&D, but I'm gonna show you the uh, thing that I've built where uh, we're now collecting a, um, uh, APRS uh, dyslexia. There's too many A's and extra letters. You'd think I'd be good with an, uh, acronyms. Amateur packet radio system. Um, sorry, recovering fetaholic. I speak in tongue and acronyms and things like that still. Uh, but also working on integrating Moto Turbo and P25 collection uh, into it as well. And on our way down to Shmukon, Mike and I kind of spitballed the idea of possibly integrating police radar uh, as a possible means because it's software defined radio and you can, uh, whatever. Anyways. Here's a great example of what you can do with uh, the airplane bits and bobs. So uh, this one is slightly out of date uh, from a screenshot standpoint. Wow, that looks awful on the slides there. But what you uh, get out of it is uh, an airplane and you can highlight an alert when certain airplanes are overhead because like uh, your uh, IAOC, -A -A CAO, thank you. ICAO is registered with the FAA, and if you look for words like department or police or law, 
or things like that, you can just like screen search that and then highlight in Kismet like when, when a helicopter is overhead or a plane is registered to that. Like you've, you're not running a radar detector when you're on a highway at that point, uh, but they're announcing their presence to you. So in this particular case is a screenshot of a plane uh, that was bizarre to me because it started exhibiting an interesting flight pattern uh, over the uh, Philadelphia area. I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat. Uh, let's keep watching this. Uh, so this is from FlightAware's history of a recent flight path of said plane. That's, that's kind of neat looking. Um, and it started doing the same sort of thing. And it got really, really loopy around there. There's no airfield near there. Uh, so I looked it up, and sure enough, uh, FlightAware had a picture of it. And um, uh, they're not a parcel service. They're not a training company. They're just kind of there in existence, and that's embarrassing for some people. So Kismet can help you highlight and alert uh, some of that sort of stuff as well. You don't have to like do that crazy stuff of like, hey, is this thing doing figure eights or boxes or things like that? It's just, has this thing been overhead of me for more than like mm, a minute or two minutes? Because usually aircraft are like horizon to horizon. So if it's kind of hovering over you for a little bit longer than normal, then maybe something's a little weird. So let's talk about adding custom data sources into Kismet, because this is some of the other life lessons learned that I've had in order uh, to get here. It's Python 3.7, um, but uh, you need to know, you can focus more on the Python stuff. Everyone is more generally comfortable with Python than they are with C++. That's cool, because you're not going to need to be an expert in C++. You'll need to be able to understand some things, but you can do a lot of copy pasta with it, uh, and a lot of string search replace. So let's get to that. The other component of it is I'm going, to, I'm going to talk parallel about like you have a thing that you want to study and shove into Kismet. And uh, in this case, the easiest thing that is heavily documented is uh, APRS for ham radio. Uh, for anyone who knows about APRS, it is a terrible protocol in my opinion because uh, there's so many different ways so many different messaging frame types uh, that I'm even still like trying to wade through in order to parse and all that stuff. But all that aside, uh, so for ShmooCon, I built this little board that was in the spirit of all, <coughs> the spirit of all things Kismet, where uh, there's a project called uh, the Micromodem, and it is a transmit receive, uh, oh, it's a transceiver for APRS for ham radio operators. Uh, he GPL'd uh, the schematic and all that sort of stuff. I ripped off the ability to transmit off of it because Kismet's a totally passive thing. Um, and then I added some filters and uh, mudged around a few passives so that it would totally be a passive thing. Uh, it uses a AT Mega 328P uh, to, as its uh, MCU, so it's, easy, it's Arduino. You can flash it any way that you would like. Uh, and what it's doing at that point is taking all the information that it gets and poops it out as JSON across the USB interface into Kismet. And of course you need to add a blinking light. So this is the Oshpark uh, blue version, uh, not blue, purple version of it, and I can plug that in in uh, a moment to show you. Uh, actually I will. Uh, but there's another lesson learned that I had with this that I'll cover as well. So if, uh, I've got a handful of these boards left for anyone who would like one. Uh, the Wireless Village has a stack more of them, so uh, you can bum rush them later. But the big thing that I learned about moving the data from a thing that you're going to build into Kismet or if you're going to write a, a plugin or need to keep a separate application separate for licensing reasons or anything else, use JSON as your middleman uh, for shoving data back and forth between the two things so that there is an easier delineation between application and data source and all that sort of stuff. So the first files that you're going to need to modify from the uh, build process is configure AC, make file.in, and kismet server.cc. Just open them up. Here's what you add in uh, uh, the uh, configure AC is like, hey, I'm going to add my thing in. Those lines, that's all you got to do. Done. All right. In your make file, you're going to need to add some specific things uh, like uh, referencing the object file that's going to be the output of the compilation. Uh, and then you also need to say, like, I need to compile this thing. Uh, like, build it by default 
and then all the way at the bottom, uh, you need to make one more reference to it. So in short, you can do a search for like ADSB inside of it and copy those code blocks wherever they are and just rename them to be what it is that you're going to do. So, so far, copy pasta. We're actually almost done. So uh, what's really great is now lastly in the kismet server.cc, you need to include your header files for what it is that you're going to uh, be capturing. You need to add the phi reference because uh, physical devices are referenced as uh, phi. So uh, there's, this cons uh, there's this thing that Mike has called the device tracker and it's tracking all the physical devices and all that stuff. So you need to say like kismet, use the thing that I'm using. And then you need to add, uh, that's also coupled with the data source. So you need to register the data source with stuff coming in. Um, so it'll actually, it's not so much that you have it plugged in, it'll say, yeah, I can do this, but if it's not going to know what to talk to, it's not going to talk to it. These are the files that you need to duplicate. Uh, one directory uh, and individual files. Alrighty, uh, what they are is your data sources, your files. Uh, there's a directory uh, that has a whole bunch of Python uh, code in it and you'll just do all your heavy work and front end work in Python. And then lastly, you need to copy uh, the uh, front end presentation component uh, for Kismet, which is just a JavaScript file. And this is where you can get uh, uh, really fancy with like how things get highlighted or alerted or uh, anything else as it is presented to you from the data that you have. So for your data sources, um, Mike, Mike is amazing when it comes to documentation. In fact, I believe his project is one of the best documented open source projects out there. Um, yeah, like seriously, it's, he puts a lot of work into it and that, it's, it's amazing um, as to how much uh, he's done on it. It's no big whoop, like seriously, just go to that website and read up on data sources. It's got everything that you need to know. This is not an RTFM component. It's a straight up, just go there and read it. It is built out wonderfully. But uh, then, you know, once you uh, open up those uh, two files, first things first, open it up in VI, copy and paste uh, uh, your, you know, string search replace for what it is you're going to create as your own, and you're done with that. <laughs> okay, you don't really have to know a lot of C++ for that part. So, nextly, uh, what we're going to do is take data from Python, uh, from within Kismet, and define the field types, like uh, from JSON, like what, what it is that we're going to uh, push across. First things first, we got to reduplicate everything, uh, string search and replace from within VI, not Emacs or Nano or any of that other crap. Uh, but the big thing that you really want to take a note in in the uh, C++ file is you search for a string uh, which is comment line, which is a uh, synth a Mac out of it, uh, which is, um, so every device from a physical component inside of Kismet is uniquely tracked based upon its Mac address. So if you are not synthesizing a unique identifier for a Mac address, then what will happen in the presentation of the user interface is that the, you'll have one line that continuously gets updated with new devices, but it's just one line. Ask me how I know. Um, there's a lot of simple ways of synthesizing a MAC address uh, within it. Uh, it's already documented in the code right there, so just pick which one that you want to do, and now Bob's your uncle. Metaphorically, unless Bob is actually your uncle. So, factually stat uh, accurate statement. Uh, last but not least, you got your presentation piece. One thing that, uh, you know, first things first, string search replace, you're done. Um, but uh, another thing that you may want to consider is whether or not if there's something unique about the device that you're going to uh, have displayed is whether or not you want it to be highlighted. So for instance, in uh, the airplane stuff, if it's looking for certain words in certain fields, you can say like, hey, if this field has this word in it, <coughs> I'm not gonna be able to get that octave. Boop, um, uh, highlight. Or uh, if Renderman happens to be walking around you, make it an audible alert. <laughs> so, uh, and then the last little component uh, that you want to pay attention to in the JavaScript is the add device detail, and this is the side pop-up on the left side, so like any additional fields that you want to have displayed there, any hyperlinks to external resources, uh, like 
hey, we got the tail number of this plane, you collect the tail number and it takes you to FlightAware, that's where that code uh, goes in. So it's very, very straightforward, wonderful JavaScript there. It's actually really clean and easy to read JavaScript. It's one of the few times I can say that. So, oh, or, or, come on, there we go. So if everything is working great and uh, you've done what I've just told you to do, like simple string search and replace, when you run dot slash configure, you should see your line item pop up saying like, yes, it's now going to be a part of Kismet. If you run make, it might work. Uh, you didn't cha uh, you changed a few things, but you're just going to be doing, you're going to be making a lot. Um, sorry, weird joke for myself personally. Uh, but the, the uh, you're going to go through, <laughs> you should see Mike's face right now. <laughs> no. Um, <clears throat> that is, I do not approve look. Uh, but the, the process is going to be a little bit iterative of uh, debugging any kind of uh, C types that you're going to be running into, but you're mostly there. You're like 80% done at this point. So congratulations. You've gotten a lot of the work done. You can have your Christmas beans. That's a safe search image. That's Venus. Anyways. So I shall try and tempt the demo gods and uh, show you all some things. So while I was here at Shmu, I brought two Baofangs. You make my heart sing, Baofang. Anyways, um, it's funny to me, shut up. The, uh, actually, I'll do this slightly in reverse. So I, I set my gear up in my hotel room. Uh, I'm checked out, so I can tell you I was on the seventh floor. Um, but there, I, I plugged things in. The original computer released the purple smoke, and that was cute. Uh, and then the Wireless Village came to the rescue and lent me a uh, power adapter for an Intel Nook, and that's been running the whole weekend. So I have another Baofeng running in the hotel room right now. And uh, since Thursday, no, Friday, it's been collecting. Uh, for APRS transmissions in the area. And I thought that because we were here on Embassy Row, there would be a lot. Well, so like Friday goes by, there's just like one dude. Uh, the whole time like, okay, uh, maybe it's my height, my elevation, where I'm looking. All right, well, apparently last night there were a lot of ham radio operators in the area. So I will show you the screenshots first and then we'll go over to Kismet and then Alt Tab. So this is the, like, does anyone else's table in their hotel room look like this? then you're doing cons right, in my personal humble opinion. So, uh, in the uh, lower right hand corner is uh, the Baofeng that's doing the sniffing. The blue LED is there showing that there's activity on APRS coming in. Uh, then there's a hot mess in the table because cable management and um, everything else is just straightforward. So, as of this morning, these are all the people that I was uh, picking up. Uh, Wow, that looks really great for you guys, doesn't it? Uh, you can't really see that too well. It looks great for me, so screw you. Um, but in short, you got a list of Kismet uh, lines, and and so you got the ham radio call sign right here in this first column. Uh, the it's screaming, it's coming from a Rust APRS device, and as packets are received and decoded, the packet counter kind of does its little tick, 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 tick. So uh, if you click on one of the users, you can't see it on there, but you can see it here if you want to come up. Uh, what's that? Yeah, well, I'll read it to you. It says source call sign, destination call sign, so APRS messages are like, I'm sending a message from me to someone else. Uh, sometimes there's a GPS uh, attribute uh, with it as well, so it pulls that out. So it's got the latitude and longitude, uh, the object type, and then because uh, I'm still decoding a lot of the like frame types of APRS, it just is giving me the whole sentence uh, of what it just decoded so I can try to figure out are there kind of like wonky offsets or things like that, and that's the last thing down there. Um, so let's see here. If Alrighty, so this is the live, oh, actually, if I highlight it like that, you can kind of see it. So this is the uh, system in the bedroom, oh, the hotel room that I am checked out of. Um, and there we go.
are 17 devices uh, that we picked up over the weekend. So this person has been talking for quite some time. I've received a total of 34 frames uh, out of them. And here is that contrast okay? Oh, well, there's the messages that are coming in from it. So this will also save everything inside of the Kismet log files and things like that as well. So you can easily remap everything on top of like even Google Earth. Uh, and all the other little bits and bobs uh, that Kismet promotes on that. And also, let's see, while we're at it, uh, how many airplanes did I get? Oh, three, all right. Um, so, you know, no time like showing something else off. Uh, we got the reg on that one. Let's see if this one has, ah, yeah, there's a uh, track it on FlightAware. All right, cool. So, uh, there's all that stuff going on that Kismet now eh, supports. So now you see it, now, now you know it. The uh, other thing uh, that I wanted to talk about was when you build custom hardware for data sources, it's really useful to build something that's gonna spoof the messages <laughs> so you can debug it and not have to wait for like real messages in the wild. So uh, because it's all based on Arduino stuff, this is my uh, APRS message spoofer uh, that's going in and just sending messages into Kismet rather aggressively, as you can see from the packet graphs here. Um, and so it's showing uh, you know, the source desk, the uh, latitude and longitude, and uh, the raw data uh, as it's being decoded, but like, I'm, I wish I had done this sooner in the project. Uh, Gesundheit. And the, um, do, 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 do. so yeah, that's pretty much all the demo there is for that. So let's get back to there. So I'll cover a few other uh, quick lessons learned, and then I'll plug that in in a minute. Um, but when you, yeah, like I mentioned, like when you build custom hardware uh, for anything in this framework, build something that's just gonna spoof the messaging framework so you can debug that and just move forward. Uh, another thing that helped me in this process was taking a look at a lot of uh, Mike's Git commits over, uh, over time. So when I first started working on the uh, 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 submitting uh, code in for uh, airplanes and things like that, RTL433 was my go-to to uh, figure out how to do all that sort of stuff. Uh, then I stopped writing code for, for it for about a year. Things changed over the year. Uh, then my talk got accepted, and then I went madly dancing into uh, madly dancing on the lip of the volcano in developing hardware and software for this talk. So uh, went back to the Git repo, saw what's changed over time. It's like I said, it's heavily documented and very well documented, and it it kind of teaches you in and of itself. So go through, take a look at that. There's a Discord channel for Kismet now that's very active. Uh, there's a lot of help that can be provided for anyone and everyone there. And um, in order to get to it, go to kismetwireless.net. There's a link to it on that website, and it'll drop you right in. Like I said, another big lesson learned that I had is that I was not paying attention to the software licensing of certain libraries that I was using before. It's GPL version 2. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, so if you're not paying attention to it, you're going to have to refactor a lot of code. Um, and in this in the construct of what I'm specifically doing, uh, the room for improvement, the next steps are to not have like custom hardware like this. This was like more of a thought experiment for me to show you that you can do it yourself. Uh, but just it should just be exactly doable in an RTL SDR. So why not just keep it completely inside of a software defined radio framework instead of having to do custom hardware and all that sort of stuff. So that's. That's another step for improvement. If you want to do it on custom hardware and leave it on that side, the big thing that I would do is scooch over the USB interface so it's a little bit more centered on the board, uh, shrink the board's width a little bit more so it now has the profile of kind of like a USB thumb drive so it can sit happily in the hub uh, with other devices. <clears throat> so lastly, uh, I got a lot of thanks to give to uh, my wife and my family for putting up with uh, the last month and a half of me madly focusing on this, uh, as well as uh, White Ops for putting up with me for uh, having some time and focus on this. Um, and uh, uh, especially my daughter, uh, she's absolutely adorable. Um, I'm not biased in that opinion. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like she, when she introduces people around the house, she goes, "And this is the family room. And that's where Daddy works. Daddy has a lot of projects." Um, and it's, uh, she was really respectful of not playing in a very specific area because she saw me working really hard on it, and she was curious and she, you know, sit there and ask questions and things like that. But she's a great kid in the sense like. She won't play in an area if she sees me working in an area, and that's like awesome. I did not train her to do that. Yeah, she, yeah, she also has all of her fingers <laughs> from these projects. Um, also, a lot of thanks to Dragorn for being extremely patient with me over the years. Uh, he's a great teacher, uh, great friend, great, great asset to the community. Um, I'd also like to thank the Wireless Village for rescuing me last minute by providing me a, uh, a power brick for my computer that's running right now. To all the hardware devs that are out there, like Mike Osman, Dominic Spill, uh, Travis Goodspeed, and more, like sources of inspiration on showing how to do a thing, uh, follow some of the processes and trailblazing of documentation and uh, uh, promotion of hardware in free and open source world. Finally, ShmooCon CFP board, as well as everyone else who woke their asses up this early in the morning after a party like last night. Why is our glitter all over the floor? Um, uh, well, no, I don't need to ask that question. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming so early in the morning. And um, shameless plug, uh, there's a conference coming up in two months called Whopper Summit. Mike and I are giving uh, classes there about how to do exactly this in higher fidelity and detail. Uh, it's going to be hands-on. Uh, we're going to get handsy. Uh, there's, there, there's that face again. I, I'm going to need to make him. Uh, yeah, I'm going to need to make a gif of disappointed Mike. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're teaching a class, at a workshop that's uh, two two-hour blocks. We did one last year that was a four-hour long session. We're not doing that again. Otherwise, you're going to sound like this. Uh, but we're giving a class on hardware design and architecture, uh, how to scale your projects, and then uh, as well as shove it into Kismet. So uh, that's in uh, the end of March. It's up by uh, Philly, so please come. Uh, if you're coming and you haven't gotten your hotel registration done, please do that now. Uh, and uh, I'll take questions in a moment. <clears throat> but the, uh, the real quick thing I wanted to show you is, is uh, one thing I learned about Baofeng's uh, is that their squelch uh, detection mechanism is kind of garbage. Uh, because you can easily lose the preamble of an APRS message. So uh, when running something like this, it's best to um, disable the squelch. So let me go ahead and plug this humdinger in. All right, it's alive. It blinked twice at me. So if I go over there and do that and hit that button and do that, all right, it's live. So this is what it would do when it's starting to receive audio signals over its internal squelch, and that's how you don't miss packets. Uh, learned that two weeks ago. So anyways, that's um, quote Forrest Gump. That's all I got to say about that. Um, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, how much time do I got left? Oh yeah, 15 minutes almost. Exact. So right on target. So any questions, queries, posers? No one threw shit at me yet, so that's great. Uh, where was the hand? <laughs> yes. How is Mac randomization messing with my security system? Um, amazingly, people have more than one electronic device on them, uh, but also the wireless networks that you're beaconing and probing for, uh, the periodicity of them uh, is also unique to you in my experience, especially when you live in a suburban area. So one of the things that had been useful for me was I now can answer the question of like, did my mail just get delivered? Because the mailman uses a barcode scanner that has Bluetooth in it. And it's consistently paired, and so that's kind of cool. Uh, that was useful. The FedEx driver has an iPhone. <laughs> uh, so I know when Steve comes by. Um, <laughs> Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm 
That was a long question. I think there was a few parts, but I think there are holistically around antenna design or antenna choices for minimizing your uh, over collection and over bearing, like keeping things within a tighter area. Half mile? Oh, cool. Well, so uh, for those who are not ham radio operators, I highly recommend that you become ham radio operators because you learn a lot about antenna theory. Uh, in that uh, process. And uh, there's another uh, thing called uh, Technical Surveillance Countermeasures, uh, TSEM audits. And one of the things that they teach you about it is like you don't want like the best antenna in the world, you actually want a really crappy antenna. Because if you have the best antenna in the world, that signal is going to look strong no matter where you're at. So one of the things that I liked to do was take like a coax cable, chop it, and make it really horrible so it, it turned into like something I could go, oh wait, wait, it's right over here, uh, versus like collecting it in its entirety of the room. So for myself, uh, for the TPMS stuff, I like having a, uh, uh, a better antenna for that because it's not constantly barking out identifiers uh, like within the construct of your uh, driveway or your neighborhood block. So having a, a, like a, higher, a higher gain antenna for that works better than having a higher gain for Wi-Fi or Bluetooth because I wanted to just, that's a very noisy thing. So you can keep that one uh, as a very lossy antenna or a mismatched antenna in order to um, uh, minimize uh, the footprint in which you are trying to collect uh, from and about. So uh, I, I think that would be the better use of prepositions there. So anyways, yeah, that, that would be, I think that was answering the fundamental spirit of the question um, does TV land agree? Not yet. Uh, not yet, okay. All right. Uh, other things that I had done was uh, because the uh, sniffer box is outside, uh, you got to pay attention to, like NEMA 4 boxes are great, but you got to make sure that you're also cooling the things on the inside uh, adequately. Uh, so keeping them in the shade is great keeping them away from moisture prone environments like downspouts is also great. Um, I did not learn those lessons. I just know those things from prior lessons. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, uh, think about where you're placing it. Uh, also elevation, you don't need to have it on the roof of your house because that covers further distance for propagation. You can have it uh, be lower. Uh, yeah, that, those are the various strategies that one can employ to just kind of collect the stuff that's locally there. Yes, sir. Two minutes, okay. Uh, was your sniffer evidence accepted in court? Yes. So my sniffer evidence was accepted in court, and the guy pled. You didn't have to appear? Nope, I did not have to appear. Like, poof, smoke, here I am. <laughs> yes, Render. Uh, so uh, Render's question is associated around uh, combining the information from Kismet with other security apparatuses uh, that you may have in your house like security cameras or other mechanisms in order to correlate presence of a thing or a person to an identity um, with the data that is being collected from the radio infrastructure. Is that appropriate rephrasing? Um, I don't know if this would violate my wife's don't be too creepy clause. Uh, but yes, it's act. Yeah, it's render. Yeah, there. <laughs> yes, it's actually very easy to do because you have timestamp data inside of Kismet that's uh, from when it was last seen, uh, first seen, and uh, currently when it's being seen as well. So it should not be that difficult to say, "Hey, a thing showed up." Tell the cameras to start recording, and if you wanted to try to correlate that later, so like when the device shows up, actually that could be a really neat idea. So like whenever you show up, Kismet's just going to have a picture of you. <laughs> <laughs> the icon for Kismet and the uh, HTML bar changes to render space. <laughs> I don't want to make this rated R. <laughs> uh, last question, I guess. Have I used this information from home, on home automation purposes? Absolutely. Uh, so the uh, component. 
um, for the car. Uh, there's this construct called uh, Massent, uh, which you can take a look at passive uh, radio emissions of electronic devices. And at the time, I had a, a Subaru Outback that had a very noisy alternator uh, cap. And I was able to open and shut my garage door based upon the presence of the signaling from it. I couldn't footprint it, but it was there. So it kept me from killing myself because uh, you couldn't lock yourself in the garage. Um, but it was, a, it was a thought experiment more than anything else. But yes, you can uh, easily say like, hey, this combination of devices are here. Disarm the alarm system. Uh, I've done some level of automation with that already uh, in my house for some other specific things. Uh, but yes, you can easily do that.